All right, everyone. It was super cool to see you, Guy, here at Salt Lake City at Filevine's user conference. They asked us to kick off the show. There are all these people here. We don't know what to do. Usually, we're just locked in dark rooms uh, staring at each other. But uh, we are super grateful to be here. And thank you all for showing up to this live recording and question and answer session for Lunch Hour Legal Marketing. So this is literally standing room only. And we were going to pull someone off the street if no one showed up. So I appreciate all of you guys getting up here. This show is about you today. The show is for you. We've got someone walking around with a microphone to ask questions, and I would love any. And then the first person asks a question, the, the, jaw, the ice, the jawbreaker, the icebreaker, icebreaker, or a jawbreaker, or a jawbreaker. Um, we'll give away some cool stuff. What do you guys want to know? We could cover the news. We do. So if you're a uh, anybody ever heard of Lunch Hour Legal Marketing before? A couple of people. Okay, we got a couple fans. Thanks for coming. We appreciate it. So we do have a format. We're going to kind of deviate from that. But first, we do typically cover the news. So yeah. we'll talk a little news. You think of your questions. What uh, news is out there in legal marketing world today, Conrad? Well, apparently, there's a big purchase made in the agency world. Oh. Yeah. Do you know anything about this? Nope. Oh, you are a liar. He's already lying to the audience. Don't trust me. All right. Uh, Scorpion purchased uh, GNGF. Our good friend Mark Homer uh, is now moving all of his clients over to Scorpion. So congratulations to both of you guys. Scorpion's downstairs if you guys want to go talk to them and see what that's about. But uh, yeah, big news in the agency acquisition world. Anything else going on that we should be talking about? Um... Well, there's some exciting, this is going to be placed in later, we can't give it away, but there's some big news coming from Filevine that I'm sure a lot of you are here to learn about, but we can't say anything about it because we're under embargo, but people are listening on the podcast, it will be spliced in. You'll know, uh, we, Guy and I were lucky to get a sneak peek into Filevine's big announcement that's coming later today, and you guys will all hear about that, so enjoy that. We be, even beat Bob Ambrosi We knowing. beat Bob Ambrosi, the original news, legal, Source. digital news guy. Godfather. Yeah, he doesn't even know about this yet, and we do. So we feel special. He probably knows now, though. I don't know. All right. I don't know. All right, what do you guys want to know? Any question? Tactical, philosophical, parenting? I told you we're going to give something away. How long have you folks been in business doing this, these podcasts? The give, podcast? Give, give, give your a quick life story, Conrad. My quick life story. I Tell them about Avo, Conrad. Well, I always try and avoid Avo because none of you guys like Avo anymore. <laughs> uh, so I started this in 2006, um, doing digital marketing in the legal world, uh, running SEO for Avo, which at the time was very rev revolutionary. Um, I've had the agency for 11 years now. Geez, your agency is a lot older than mine. Is it? No, a couple of years. 2008. Years. We started in 2008. It's a good time. When did you and start? We've, we've been doing this pod together for three years, I think, three, three and a half years. But it pre-existed both of us. It was originally started by Jared Correa. One of the things that, you know, lots of people are excited about doing pods here, so I'm trying to go tactical already. Lots of people get excited about launching a podcast, and lots of podcasts get launched. 83% of them fail in the first six months. And there is huge value in the longevity and having things keep going. And so I think one of the successes of our pod is the fact that it's been around for so long, and it predates both of us. Yeah, I think consistency is key. I mean, I think that's true in marketing in general. Um, I, I founded my agency in 2008. Uh, we, I was with uh, Kelly Street was my co-host when we f first joined Legal Talk Network. Uh, but I think you just celebrated your 100th episode? 100th episode, yeah. 100th so. with Conrad. So it's been going on longer than that, but a couple of years. And yeah, I think the consistency is really important. Um, getting people involved, like it's, you know, a lot of the shows, whether you do guests or you have people submitting questions, we found that to be a really helpful way to get uh, more people engaged. So thank you for your question. I've got one over here. Okay. Go. How do you choose your topics and which do you find to be most successful in drawing audiences? Love that question. <sighs> Great. So we used to plan them ahead of time. And we, we would have these, we, we, do, we did an hour long session where we'd come up with an idea. And it's a fairly formalized template where we have news and then a segment and then a break and we may answer a question then we'll do the next segment. And, and we, we kind of thought through that. We had so much fun recording or, or figuring out what we were gonna talk about. We had so many good sound bites while we were coming up with ideas that we decided to smush them together. So every now and then we would, so, so now we do, a, we do our planning session right before, literally right before we do the um, actual recording. And the reason for that is when we were doing the planning, there were so many good sound bites that went back and forth between me and Guy that it was like, 
let's hold our powder on this and actually make sure that this gets recorded. And by doing it literally back to back, you make sure you don't forget those brilliant ideas that you had, right? Yeah, my favorite topics actually come from the audience. Um, you know, so we go out on social media and say, hey, if you've got a topic you'd like yeah. to learn more about or if you've got a question, you know, hence this format, right, we're doing Q&A here. But um, because again, I think I get the most satisfaction out of it is when I'm actually answering a question that somebody really has, right? Like if I'm just like, you know, talking like marketing hyperbole, it's like not as effective. But if someone's like, hey, this is going on at my firm and we can go deeper on that, I think that that's really valuable and we get good feedback from it. So that's what I find to be the most rewarding topics, but love that question. And we're actually talking about changing around our, how we do prep uh, to give us a little more time because right now we prep right before the show, which if you want to go deep on something, it's harder to do. So we're going to bump it out a week before. Um, and so, you know, it's a balance of how much time do you want to invest in it? When do you want to do certain things, coordinating schedules and recording? And so uh, all that combined, I think that uh, this new way we're going to do is going to be interesting. And we're very transparent about our process and how we do it. I and mean, we've talked about uh, metrics we've measured and uh, growth metrics. Uh, what are we measuring metrics wise these days? Um, well, Lisa's right there. We were talking about how Apple has changed the way they actually count downloads. Um, and it, it actually dropped the count of downloads by about 20%. This happened around December, I think. Um, and so we really care about listenership because we are funded by the advertisers and we do care about people listening to this a lot. So that is a really big, important thing for us. We are seeing kind of this beautiful graph slowing up and to the right. We find that the most listened to episodes are from user questions where we get tactical. The, the last episode we did was really good. We did a, we randomly, kind of randomly chose a- Randomly. Law, well, it was, it was quasi randomly. We carefully chose a law firm website to tear apart. And we sat down and kind of went over all the different tools that we would use to look at a law firm's website as we were kind of looking at things from the outside. And that one was really, really good. The, the trick there, and this is why Guy said kind of randomly, if, if we did that in real time, sometimes you wouldn't find anything interesting. And it'd be like, everything looks good here, right? And so we, we kind of had to carefully pick what we worked on. But that was a, that was a really good episode. Um, so we're an immigration law firm based on the East Coast, uh, predominantly for a Latino audience. Okay. And most of our referrals right now are coming in through... Uh, most of our leads are coming in through referrals okay. and social media marketing. It's been performing really well. Yep. At what point do we start bringing on, well, at what point do we start doing SEO, Google, pay-per-click, that kind of thing? Go ahead. I have no idea when you should start, but um, you know, I, and in fairness, like for us to really give you good advice of like, if this is the right time for you to do it or how much money to spend or how to invest or which agency to go with, we'd have to have a much longer conversation. But um, I think high level, this is what I would say, you know, always start with the economics of your firm, right? Like if you have a sense of what the value of a client is and you start working your way backward and say, okay, I can spend this much money to acquire a client, then you can start thinking about like where you want to deploy resources, both time and money. Um, you know, I would say this just, and this is kind of like the SEO talking point, like SEO is great if you're starting brand new and you're in a competitive market and a competitive practice area, like it's probably going to take some time. Um, the other thing that I would be uh, very sensitive to is language. You know, it sounds like um, if you're serving a certain community that might not be speaking English, like stuff you do on your website matters a lot from an SEO standpoint. Um, and, and, and so I think the, the buzzword there would be like international SEO. Um, but you know, I, the, the good thing about SEO is if that if you have resources in house that you can start working on it, you can start right now. You don't have to pay anybody except you know the time that you're spending to do that, which is a, a positive. Um, ads, you know, ads can be tricky. Um, you know, a lot of people open. It's really, Google makes it really easy to open an ads account, but to actually like manage media to a co target cost per acquisition and the right client, that's a lot harder. And so. Um, you know, again, for me, it always comes back to the economics. If you've got a target cost per acquisition, you've got a budget you want to experiment with, it's usually worth trying some new things, but um, when to do that, how much to spend, it's really hard without having a deeper conversation. And, and that really goes to, wh where do you want to go with it firm, right? Like, how, how aggressively do you want to grow? Like, I know there are people in the room right now who are like, I'm trying to take over this market, and that means every channel, right? And in, in, in immigration, in the Latino market, like, we know this, a lot of really good business come, can come from re referral through social, right? Like that's the right game to play, but it's a portion of the market. So you are not playing, you're ignoring, I'm pulling this out of the air, you're ignoring 60% of the market, which may be fine, right? Because you're able to acquire clients through social media work and that's completely fine. If you wanna own it, 
you need to play across channels, and that has a completely different calculus. Um, and I would think that through. And then the other component to this that, that, that Guy didn't mention is the time element. Pay-per-click is the tap you can turn on right now, right? And you turn it off, and so you can turn that up and down based on how busy you are, like you know that. And the SEO has a, has a much longer term play. Um, so I would be thinking through those elements. Great. Uh oh. <laughs> oh, jeez. Who, who let him, him in? I don't even know if it's done. So, Jason Hennessy, I have a law firm. Uh, I do personal injury, but I also have a side hustle where I am a really good dog groomer. So, do you guys recommend me merging those two practices together on one website? You're a really good dog groomer? Yes. I can see your hair looks fantastic. <laughs> um, well played. So, the question Jason is really asking is, um, if you do completely different practice areas, should those live on separate websites? Um, I think that this is a tough one. So if it's dog grooming, I would say <laughs> not topically related enough. But you know, I think there are, you know, if you've got practices and sub-practices and you want to consolidate uh, topics on a site, I think that's fine. But as Jason knows, which is why he threw us the softball question, <laughs> you know, the more specific that a domain or a website is about a particular topic, the better it tends to do in Google, right? And so, if you, the, you know, trying to go general on personal injury is not going to be as effective as a site that's dedicated to, uh, you know, bicycle pedestrian accidents uh, along the, uh, you know, specific geographic area. Um, so that's what I would tend to say. That the trade-off is, though, is, is that the more that you separate sites across domains the more authority that you're trying to build up across these sites. And so you have to have resources to be able to deploy to be able to do that, especially if you're talking about like a local context. Um, as a lot of us know, like in the local pack, the map results, you've got Google business profiles. You can't create a Google business profile for every practice area you've got. And so then you start thinking about like, well, am I going to have a website that's on this topic that's not tied to a Google pre business profile? Maybe it's a content website. Um, but I think generally speaking, if topics, if, if there's practice areas that you have, that are not related to each other at all, I tend to say put them on different websites, but I know that there's um, different views but on that. It's, I mean, it's, twice, it's more than twice as expensive to, to market two websites. That is, that is the hard part of this. If you have the resources to market those two websites, fine. But I'll use kind of the ridiculous question as an example. It really depends on the assets that you're sitting on, right? And so it depends what you've got. So giving, us giving a theoretical answer without looking at those specific assets is kind of... Um, Silly. I'll, 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 let me extend this further, and I'm not recommending this, but you, you, you could make an argument that this would work. If you're winning in PI in downtown Chicago, and your kid has a dog grooming business on the side, you can throw dog grooming on that domain and probably crush it because the domain authority is so strong compared to rest of all, the rest of all the kind of run. I'm, I'm assuming there's not a big dog grooming fight on the web, but it's possible <laughs> that because your domain authority is so unbelievably strong that you could take something that's completely topically not relevant and actually be successful. You guys are all familiar with For the People, right? That business now hasn't gone into dog grooming, but it is able to continuously add different practice areas that Morgan & Morgan does not do in-house because of the authority of, of, of the domain. And so you have to look at the assets here. Yeah, look at Forbes.com, right? Oh. I mean, Forbes.com, <laughs> they just throw up new pages and rank right away for everything, uh, which is super frustrating. But I think a lot of people see that and think they're going to do that. And if you don't have an established site, you know, I'd be much more thinking like exact match, partial match domains, because as you know, those work really well still, even though Google says they're not supposed to. Great question, Jason. Thank you. Hey guys, I'm, I'm curious to know what piece of advice you're giving to law firm owners that they're either too slow to implement, underinvested in, or simply don't believe? All of the above. What do you got, Conrad? I, I think the piece of advice that is ignored the most is stop looking at what everyone else is doing. Because everyone else has a, like, I keep using the word assets. Everyone else has a different set of assets and liabilities. What, how strong is your domain? Where are your offices? What, are, what, are, what is your unique niche? Like there are all of these different elements. You need to look for where do you have that unfair competitive advantage? And that can be in your positioning. It can be in your geographic reach. It could be in your review count. It can be in your backlink profile. It can be in your content. Like there's so many elements of this. It can be in the fact that you're willing to take anyone with an insurance card and a pulse, right? That's an asset. 
right? That is an asset that you can leverage. And so I think the law firms, you're, you're like, oh, well, they're, you know, I, I talked to law firms the other day. They're, 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 they're killing it. They're everywhere on pay-per-click. And I'm like, that doesn't necessarily mean the economics work for them even, and it, it doesn't necessarily work for you either. So I think starting with what everyone else is doing is the wrong, wrong approach. I think you need to start with an understanding of your assets. Where do you have that unfair advantage? And where, or, or where can you create an unfair advantage? Because it's a bloodbath out there, right? Like we know this, it's brutally hard. Everyone's, everyone's doing this. So, so where, where do you have an unfair place to compete? Because it's such, it, it is not a blue ocean. It is, a, it is a red ocean to quote the book. I'm forgetting the author of that book. Blue ocean strategies. Where can you find a blue ocean strategy for yourself? So mine's super boring and buzzwordy, and it's one word, it's brand. I, I'm gonna I think, say AI. I, I'm not gonna say <laughs> AI. That's, well, I'm sure we'll talk enough about AI. Um, and what I mean by that is, that's the answer to how you stand out, right? And you know, we were talking about this at dinner the other night, but the cost per acquisition of a client in a competitive space, in ads, advertising, SEO, all the channels you can think of, even social media to a certain extent, depending on what you're doing, is gonna go up over time. Whereas brand, if people are coming directly to you, that cost is not gonna go up at the same rate. It's gonna be much easier to, maybe not easier, but it's much more efficient in terms of attracting a client. But you know, no one likes that because they're like, I wanna rank number one for all of these head terms, or I wanna, you know, I've, well, I need to get 500 reviews to get all these people to fill the top of my funnel. But uh, most of the time, when we ask questions like, what are you doing to stay in touch with former clients? Nothing, why would I do that, right? What are you doing to build an email list? Nothing. Why would I do that? And so those are the ones that I think, in when you, and you, you know, I keep coming back to this Eric Schmidt thing, which I don't think he really intended when he said it, but brand sorts out the cesspool, right? Because people trust brands. When they know you, they come to you, it's going to help That's referrals. Great. And so, so much of it is, is just reminding people that you're out there, what you're doing, being active in the community. You know, Conrad, if you listen to Lunch Hour Legal Marketing, we always talk about brand affinity. You know, people that are in groups with you or, and that share the same passion that you do about whatever it is, those people are much more likely to be your people as clients as well. Um, and the, 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 the investment in building those communities uh, is a much more efficient spend. Now, again, to Conrad's point, and this is why it's so hard to answer these uh, general questions, but um, are you gonna dominate your market with brand right away? No, you're not, right? It's in, to, to be the, you know, the billboard, the everywhere lawyer, to be saturation marketing, it's a lot harder to do. Um, but I think if you're talking about like, you know, the question being like, what do lawyers under index on? It's that, they under index on brand, I think, for the most part. I was literally having this conversation two floors down over coffee about an hour ago. This is a great way to tell if your brand is strong and you have good brand affinity. Are people coming to you for things that you don't do? Which seems like the wrong answer. Like, oh, if I had a good brand, they'd know what I do. But Joe Public doesn't know or care what you do, but they know if they like you. And you will start getting those inquiries for things that you don't do because they know who you are and they trust you and they have affinity. That's, you're winning. Right? You're winning. If you find that you have to refer all those out, you're winning. You're building relationships. You're, you're building goodwill. And that to me is this, this underlooked at key for do I have a strong brand? It's are people coming to you just because it's you, regardless of what, what the issue is? Uh, Guy, Conrad, uh, Matt, live shows. Uh, to build on that question, right? There's a lot in this. There's a lot of discussion about dead web and bots reading bot content, and I think you touched on it, Guy, which was you know brand being the the answer. So, what advice would you give to a firm? You know, maybe they're they're looking to start building uh, brand. What are some things that you have seen effective? And for Conrad, uh, does that involve taking selfies and posting them to Google Business in an extended radius? As long as you geotag them. <laughs> you gotta geotag them. Wow, thanks for the drive by uh, Dig at SMB team. Go ahead. <laughs> um, well, you know, I th and, and you know, again, so I'm just gonna make up a, cause it you know, varies by the type of law firm you wanna build, right? So let's just say we're talking like local law firm, you know, direct to consumer, you know, personal injury or criminal defense, bankruptcy. Um, I, I say start getting active in the community. I, th I think that that is probably another place where I'm, when I think about brand, like 
getting involved in local organizations, local events. And this is the other thing that we talk about all the time is like the line between real life and the web is totally blurred, right? Like your people are taking pictures of us right now and posting them on social media. They're, you're going to do it at the conference. You do it in your local community when you go to do things. And so it's not like uh, in real life versus the internet. It's not uh, digital versus traditional marketing. Like they're the same thing. And so I think getting active and, and starting to create and nurture and solidify those relationships in your local community is the most valuable thing. And then you, it spreads the word, right? You start, you start naturally having conversations with people like, or maybe you join uh, private affinity groups on, in, on Facebook or something like that. But I think the intersection of what's going on in your local community is like, that's the, that's the cornerstone for a local business. If, if, you're, if that's what your firm is, a local business. Uh, to get started with building brand because it brand really is it's just reputation and relationships right it's just like what do people think about you when they think do they think about you first of all and then when they think about you do they like you do they trust you do they think you know what you're talking about do they think you're going to tell them the truth like that's how people make decisions you know difficult uh, choices about trying to hire a lawyer and i think one of the difficulties that we sit here like hey get involved in your community i'm in salt lake i'm a single lawyer i i can't build a community in salt lake don't boil the Salt Lake Ocean. Ha, ah, that's funny. You can't boil the ocean. <laughs> you totally were thinking about that. No, I was, that was not you a planned, planned joke. One. You planned that Promise. One. But don't try and boil the ocean. Like, what, what, is, what is it for you? And it, doesn't matter, it does not matter what the thing is, but it's got to be genuine to you. So how do you segment Salt Lake out into women business leaders, into uh, environmentalists, into, into, into people who are into the University of Utah? Like, whatever it might be, like, how do you build a brand within that small community first? Right. And that's that's a key. I think, you know, you're in a large city. Like, how do I build how do I build community in this huge city? You can't. But but boil part of it um, or, or own part of it and don't try and do the whole thing because you won't be successful trying to build the whole the whole the whole city. What's this about Google business profiles and picture oh, selfies? <laughs> but I'm not going to name who uh, who asked the question, but um, if anyone thinks that Taking photographs of local landmarks and putting them on your Google business profile is going to help you rank in local for that. The SMB team would like to talk to you. But you might show, wow. you might show up on a picture of the local uh, Which would be monument. great if you're looking for people wanting to go to the Space Needle. So how do you guys measure success of a marketing campaign and what metrics do you look at to define success? It's almost like you set us up there. I, and I was thinking about this as we, were, as we were talking about uh, brand. And I'm, I'm going to answer it specifically. Because the other question we get all the time is, is like, all right, so you guys are talking about like demand generation and building brand. Like, how do we know any of this is working? So the easy, an the, the, uh, easy the, the simplified answer is, is that are you hitting your growth objectives? I mean, that's the real ultimate question. And, and digging deeper on specifics on brand, and this is, I think, you know, we're at the Filevine conference. I think this is something for people who are using Filevine to think about is, how are you using your software to be able to track right. uh, these, the qualitative attribution, right? So when I say that, you know, all the software systems are set up to be like, okay, we can say someone clicked on something, you know, they came from a Google ad, or you can get all the marketing data. But when it gets into your CRM or whatever you're using to actually like open files, making sure that that information passes, that's the quantitative attribution data. Most, everybody's got that in place. You got Google Analytics, you got uh, conversion tracking, that kind of stuff. But the part that a lot of people think, forget about, is this qualitative attribution. And so when you're asking questions like, how did you hear about us? Or who do we thank for uh, referring us to you? Put that into your CRM because guess what? All sorts of stuff is going to show up that you didn't even realize, and it helps to validate the money and time that you're putting into these brand investments. Because otherwise, you know, you go to these, you're like, all right, I went to uh, Lex Summit, I listened to these guys talk about brand, so I'm going to go out in my local community, but I can't tell, is this, is this time well spent? I can't tell. I, like, there's my attribution data, I'm seeing like people are coming in for like branded queries on CPC, but was that because somebody I, I met at the park or at the event or whatever? And so make sure you're capturing that uh, in your web forms. Make sure it's part of your intake process. And people will push back and say, well, people get it wrong. And it's like, well, who cares? You still have the quantitative to back it up. But comparing your qualitative attribution data with your quantitative attribution data is a really, really important starting point for understanding if your money and time is actually working to help you achieve an objective. So let me, I'm gonna give you two answers on this. One is super tactical and one is high level. On the tactical side, we're at Filevine Lead Docket, right? One of the great things that you can do is automate the process of getting channel data into Lead Docket. 
if you use and repurpose pre-existing fields, they will automatically publish into FileVine. So now you're getting your market, dual source attribution here. You're getting your automated, like this is why the phone rang, but you're also getting the how did you hear us in another field into lead docket. If you don't touch those fields and you repurpose them, they automatically push into FileVine. So now within FileVine, you have all of your marketing information, which is really, really cool and super, super powerful because many of those systems don't necessarily work together, right? And, and by doing that, you'll get a really good insight within FileVine of what's actually working for you. That's the tactical answer. The big picture answer for me is twofold. Number one, separate out direct response with everything else. Direct response is I want, a, I want a hamburger, I look for a hamburger, I click on the hamburger, I purchase a hamburger, I eat the hamburger, right? That's direct response. Everything else is all of the community engagement that we're talking about, some of your SEO work, and I would separate those two things out because you can do that with direct response. LSAs, pay-per-click are your primary direct response concepts. And then because all of these channels start to work together, we break it out like this. You have the direct response cost per client. What am I willing to pay to acquire that client? Does that make sense? And you can do that and you can automatically calculate that by working through the tactile elements that I talked about, lead docket to FileVine. The second part of this is what we call the BFA, the big fucking average. It's everything you no, spend. we got our E. There we got our, yeah, okay, we dropped the F-bomb, sorry. Um, everything that you're getting and everything that you're spending and divide. Right? And that's what your cost per acquisition is. Because these things all work together and they're not necessarily direct. Okay, we've got a question over here. Well, you know your brand affinity is growing. Oh yeah. If you are seeing an increase in work that you don't do. Yeah. That was a revelation because I have been screaming at people being like, we're spending money and people are calling me for divorce. Yeah. I, we do personal injury work in Massachusetts in the Boston area. 60% uh, of our clients are, are Latino or Hispanic. Yeah. And we're getting cases. Now, we've, we've learned to monetize that yeah. after decades of saying, no, we don't do that. And it's craziness. Yeah. So if, you know, if I can give anyone advice here. Think of ways, if that's happening, to get good referral partners and monetize those. But I always thought, when I was talking to my marketing people, we're, we're doing a poor job. More and more people are calling me for real estate or divorce uh, within the Latino community in, in the Boston area, and I was upset by it. So am I correct in saying that that's a good thing overall? It's a great thing. Well, it's I'm gonna say it depends well, because it, okay. if- We are growing our personal injury practice, so that's continuing to grow, and I'm, right. and I'm happy with the progress. I just thought that I, I was wasting, I, I'm not narrow, I'm not niched enough, I'm not precise enough in my marketing. Okay and I'm wasting money. So I think it's great from it to the uh, affinity standpoint. So if you're building brand, people are coming to you, you're, going, you're out in the community, um, you're, you're more visible, that's a great thing. The, the, the other side of the coin though is, is that if you told me like, yeah, 90% of my PPC okay. leads are coming in because I bid on divorce lawyer, I would say that's not a great expenditure of money. Now, you might you could you could try to flip it on its head and say, well, we're doing uh, we're doing PPC media buying to have brand awareness for divorce, even though we don't do it. But that's going to be a, a very inefficient way to try to get that affinity. And so, um, anyway, I, I think about like search ads. Search ads. That's why I kind of said put that on its own. If you're talking about direct response search ads, you better be targeting the right keywords with the right messaging, because if you're trying to do brand building through that, that's gonna be extremely expensive. So there's a guy sitting two seats to your right who has nailed this, okay? And what, what happens is, you, and you said one other thing, you said we're, we're really big in the Latino community. This is the second time Latino and community has come up, okay? There's a lot of referral work that happens. Right? That market operates fundamentally differently, right? So there's a lot of referral business that happens because of that, and that is great. My read is, and, and we used to get this all the time, like, oh, I'm getting all these, all these cases that we don't want. And you're like, do something with that, right? Like, that is an asset. Like, and if you're getting that because people know and like and trust you, or you're one step removed from someone, like, you're winning, man. You're totally winning. Because you know what nobody likes in the US? Nobody likes lawyers. They like their lawyer, but they don't like lawyers. And you're getting people that are sending you business. It's amazing. If you're in a secondary, you said Boston, right? So one of the other games to play, and I think this is a really good strategy, if you are in a secondary market or a tertiary market, um, Martinson and Beeson is a great example of this in Huntsville, Alabama, although 
they may take offense now with me calling Huntsville a secondary market. But they're able to run a whole variety of practice areas because they have such a really, really strong brand affinity in that market. And, and, and that's what they've, do, they've done. They've expanded their practice area to cover a whole bunch of things. Or you're in a boss in a great big market, you stay true to what you do and, and, and what you do from a direct response perspective, but everything else you just farm out and you make great relationships with and people love it, you're winning, totally winning. Hey guys, uh, long time friend, first time listener. Um, <laughs> as we're talking about uh, brand awareness and we're at a legal tech conference, what are some ways we can use the client experience that hopefully is good at our firm to drive brand awareness and then market to new clients? Conrad, do you want to lead on this one? Well, I'll, I'll, the, the thing that immediately hits my mind is Case Status and Hona are both here, right? So you guys should all be familiar with Case Status and Hona. I would recommend using one of those tools. One of the things that they do when you move between stages, and they will talk to you about this because it's a great way for you to get them it's a great way for them to get you to buy their product. One of the things that they do is a net promoter score as people move through the funnel, right? And that gives you, not just at the end of the matter, were you happy, yeah, okay, but like you're getting multiple touch points along the way of a net promoter score for every single matter that you're working on, right? That's a way to deliver great customer service and then turn those people into your, your, your cheerleading staff, your, your marketing department, right? And so being able to have a finger on how happy your clients are throughout a process, I think is, is, is a really, it's, it shouldn't be revolutionary, but it is. And it's easy to do at this point. Yeah, I, I would just say that service is marketing. And so the better experience you're delivering on the front end, uh, the more likely someone's like gonna leave a review, right? And uh, I know you know this, uh, cause it's happened to your firm, but um, it, you might be like, hey, we're not the right firm for you, but if you take a minute to like hear their story, you make a referral, or you give them a, a, you're the shoulder to cry on in some cases, or you, re, you refer them if it's um, you know, something that can be helped with like a legal aid or something like that, you'd be surprised how many of those people will say, gosh, you know what, even though they weren't my, they end up not being my lawyer, they'll go on Google and leave a review and say, hey, you know what, I had a great experience with them. I ended up not hiring them, but they pointed me in the right direction. I'll always be grateful. Like, that's another piece where I'm always like, you know, it, people are, everybody's trying, you know, we don't have any time, right? So if we're trying to automate everything. We're like, how do we free up more time? Maybe AI can answer my emails and all this sounds great and AI can write all my content, but the people who are gonna win the future, the people who are establishing the connection and providing that service, because those people are, they're, they're gonna be like, you actually care. And like, it seems silly to say like, caring is a marketing strategy, but it really is, and the better that experience is, and you know, look, tech can support in all sorts of ways. It can give you insights into what's going on with your data, it can automate some of the things that can be automated, but uh, I always say, spend the extra time, focus on the intake, like who's doing intake for you? Uh, is that person empathetic? Are they helping these people solve problems, even if they end up not being a client? Because again, like most of the major platforms, Google, let's face it, it's a Google world. Google, if you, if you say, hey, I'm reviewing this intake part of the process, that's a legit review for you. And especially if you're in a practice area where like a lot of your clients don't wanna leave reviews because they're like, I don't want you to say like, thanks for getting me acquitted for my DUI. Um, you can get reviews for the empathy for the service. You can get uh, reviews for teaching, uh, being part of, you know, maybe you're doing a presentation in the community, but people need nudges, right? Like not everybody knows what to do. And so a lot of times people are like, thank you so much. What can I do to help you? That's the time to be like, hey, you know what? We're a referral-based business. It'd be really great if you'd be willing to go online and, and leave a testimonial on Google or you know, video testimonials are another great way. If you can put video testimonials on Google business profiles, those are really powerful. Obviously get consent and all that kind of stuff. And not every client's the appropriate client to do this, but when people want to sing your praise, reduce the friction for them, show them how to do it, make it easy for them to say nice things about you. Bonus your staff on reviews. Hi, we're here. Hi. Um, what advice do you have for people who refuse social media? Um, so I'm sorry, I'm very nervous. Um, so I work at a law firm, I do PI. I'm a senior case manager from eight to five, intake from 6 p.m. to like the next day. Um, but I'm kind of like the cool person that everyone comes to. And every time a client comes to the office, they want to meet with me, talk to me. I try to help as much as they can. And the first thing the boss always say, you need to open your social media account. However, I don't know anything about social media. I refuse social media. So what advice do you have for that? Sorry. So I think, so um, I, I'm gonna try to re-articulate the question. Like 
you're not into social media, you're getting pressured to use social media, like what should I do? And, and here's my thing with all this stuff, and it doesn't, it's not social media, it's, uh, it could be video, it could be writing blog posts, it could be speaking engagements. If it's not something that you, if it's not you, and you don't wanna do it, I would say don't do it, because um, you know, if it's something that you wanna like, that you're aspiring to learn to, great. There's all sorts of training and education stuff, but if it's just not you, it's not, there's a lot of lawyers too, and, and support folks that are just like, it's not my personality to be kind of front of the house. I would say find somebody, either either you hire somebody who likes to do that kind of stuff, and like that's gonna be their role, or you, you know, work with somebody, a, a partner, or a fractional person, or you outsource it to somebody else, but, um, people that, it, when, and you see this all the time, because like, you know, people come to our, listen to us talk, and they're like, all right, these guys said you gotta do all this stuff, and you go do it, and you're just like, I'm uncomfortable with it, and guess what, it doesn't come out being an asset anyway, it comes out being a li more of a liability to your reputation, because you're not, you're not, it's not your thing, and you don't wanna do it, and you, guess what else happens? You end up not doing it anyway, so find the things that you like to do, Spend more, and it's hard in an employer-employee relationship to have those conversations, but um, I would just come to the table and say, hey, you know, look, here's, here's what I'm really great at, here are my strengths, here's what I like to do, how can we use this to support the marketing, versus trying to like force something that it's like, I'm not comfortable with this. It, also, you're gonna create awkwardness with clients. I mean, again, the client is the most important thing. If you, and if you're, if you're feeling awkward about it, the client's gonna pick up on that, it's gonna be bad all the way around. So that's my advice is don't do it. Don't do things that you're not uncomfortable with, or you're uncomfortable with doing that you don't really wanna do anyway. And that's, that goes true for different social platforms as well, right? Like, I am all social, I love talking, like that's why Guy and I have a podcast, is because we like talking. Um, if we didn't like talking, this would, this do would be- I do for the cheeseburgers. <laughs> for the cheeseburgers, and the camaraderie. <laughs> but, but like, I'm not on TikTok because it just doesn't work for, for, the, the, for this, right? It's just that this does not belong on TikTok. Um, so don't, he's right, don't do it. And what I would honestly, if I'm sitting in your seat and I'm, you're, you're probably not gonna do this, I would push up. The social presence is not you. I would push this back up. They will be more successful. If they wanna be successful in social, it does not come from you, it does not come from the firm account, it comes from the individual. I, I really believe in that. What is your best advice when it comes to nurturing, or in other words, dating your audience with personal injury law firm socials? Dating your audience with social, right? For personal injury. For personal injury. Uh, so here, I mean, the, the reality is, what we're talking about here is, you are working on building brand affinity over time before someone has a need. And for mostly for people who do not have a need. So there are two elements to this. Number one, you need to recognize that most of the social Social work, that's not the right word. Most of the social efforts that you guys put out are going to turn to business through referrals, not directly through that social um, connection, okay? So you have to recognize that that's part of what you're doing. And the second part of that is, we talked about this a little bit earlier, who are you, what are you into, like why are you really there? Like why, are, like, we, and we try and do this, like we're, we're not, we don't just talk about the practice of, of digital marketing, like people know my, my kids, like, like who are you, and I have to be okay with that, right? So who are you and, and, and how does that get out and does that resonate with a very specific audience? And it's a long-term thing. The other part of this is, this is a long-term game, right? Like I have published a video every day for the last at least 24 months, right? Maybe 28 months. Um, it's a long-term play, right? And, and you, you can't get off the hamster wheel. Yeah, I, I agree with a lot of that. I think if I was, if I was thinking of people that are, I'm trying to, because you know, the affinity thing's really, really valuable. A awareness, I you know Conrad hates the word awareness, but even awareness has some value to it. But I'm gonna try to answer it with someone that you're like, you're trying to position yourself as, a, as an expert on something. And I think when you're dating your audience like that, it's for PI, it's about turning yourself into a safety advocate, right? It's like talking about all this the things great. that you this see at the firm, uh, you know, tips for parents, Safe, when it's back to school season, bus safety tips. Um, but you're basically becoming an advocate for safety. So when they, so in their mind, they're like, who is that person that's in our community that's always talking about these safety tips? They might be more likely to look you up, even if they're not even thinking about like hiring a lawyer. But you know, I think that the, the problem is, is that you see a lot of lawyers and they're gonna be like, this state's a comparative negligence state. And everyone's like, huh? Like, what are you talking about? And you know, look, if you wanna to market to other lawyers and like to demonstrate your expertise in the courtroom or like talk about, you know, why you're uh, especially experienced at handling a certain type of case, I think that, that can be valuable. But on the day, and, and really a lot of this is like mixing different things in, right? It's, it's doing some of the affinity stuff, like talk about the, the, the purposes, causes, and passions that you're uh, into. 
But then it's also mixing in some of the safety advocacy. I'm also big on um, you know, celebrating the location. These local markets, right? People care about their towns. They care about their, even, even in Chicago, which is a, not really a town, it's a bigger city. But like, if you're doing things that are like, you know, chicago E, then people see that and they're like, oh yeah, now I'm gonna associate you with Chicago. And so I think that the intersection of the location and your subject matter expertise through, whether for PI, I'd be thinking safety advocacy, I'd be thinking, um, you know, uh, and there's some political advocacy there. You know, you, you might be in a, a state where it's not favorable for people that are, um, you know, facing uh, injuries and trying to get recovery for injuries. So, you know, really be an advocate. What's on their mind, uh, and how can you demonstrate your expertise in that without going deep on like trying to like Iraq an issue or trying to do like a you know comparative out you know an outline on comparative negligence or something like that. First off, thank you. Good morning. Uh, so. Actually, to kind of piggyback off that question, we are fortunate enough to be able to be expanding into a new state right now. Great. And it's got the, the research that I'm in charge of. Um, but in addition to that, we're also trying to deal with a new demographic, which is the Latino and Hispanic community. Um, what tips or recommendations do you guys have for, for you know, making that expansion a success? So I'm going to go off, right off the, off the top of my head, a bunch of tactical things. Obviously, have a well-done multilingual site, right? I don't think I, and so Guy and I may disagree on this point, I would, I would keep this consistent with your existing brand, and I would have a multilingual site. I would not build another site and another brand, number one. Number two, getting involved in the community. Like the, and This is the third time this has come up now. The Latino community works with, with um, social, being involved in the community really, really more effective than, than any other sub-market that I, that I have seen. Number three, make the entire experience, if their experience starts in Spanish, the entire experience is in Spanish, right? And that includes answering the phone, right? And so, and this is really simple, but if, if I have trouble with English and I do my query in Spanish and the phone is answered in Spanish and I go to the website in Spanish, like, you, you've, you've just made the sale. You've just made the sale. And so I think looking at these tactical elements, um, wh where are you located? Uh, currently we're in Utah, Arizona, and Idaho. Okay, so it used to be that you could run a multilingual site and, multilingual and, and Spanish pay-per-click, and no one was doing it, and we were killing it for clients. The further north, you, the further you get towards Maine, the less that, 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 that still works. But if you're doing immigration in Florida, like that's no longer an asset, right? It's no longer a competitive advantage. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't have the entire experience in Spanish, though. Yeah, I, I guess I would. We had a, we actually had an episode that we talked about yeah. a lot of this stuff, and I I, I know what you're going to say. Well, do you? What you're am more, I going to say? No, no, go ahead. No, you go ahead. You were going to say not everyone in the Latino market. Don't assume that they speak Spanish in the Latino market. That's not what I was going to say, All right, good. actually. I, I was, was going to say is that representation matters. Um, I think in, in when people yes. are thinking about um, making these decisions. And so, uh, you know, if you can uh, hire people at your uh, firm that are representative of the community that you're serving, I think that that's a, a good thing, a good business sense. Um, and again, to Conrad's point, like the experience has to match like what their expectations are from the, the whole the whole way through, uh, the whole way through their uh, client journey. And so it feels very disingenuous if you if you've got all of this um, marketing that you're doing for this community, and then all of a sudden you call and it's a totally different experience, right? Like don't be surprised that your conversion rates fall off a cliff. Um, and especially if you're talking about getting involved in the community again, I think. Uh, the more that you can have uh, representative voices at your firm that are participating in that community, the more effective uh, you're going to be in that community. We've got one right here. Good morning. Hi. Good morning. So apparently now I have to take all my landmark photos down off my Google. Oh, Jesus. What am I supposed to replace them with? Uh, a refund from the agency that told you to do that. Um, no, so I mean, so it's interesting that the, the content in, in your GMB profile is actually increasingly important. One of the things, if you guys will pull out a phone right now and do a query for my name, you'll get a picture of him, right? So like what shows up, do you know that? Yeah, that's yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. So I, I tagged me yeah. on your photo yeah, or yeah. vice versa. So um, one of the things that happens is people really care about these things. So the multimedia side of this becomes really relevant. I think one of the things that law firms don't do enough of, and a few of you do way too much of, is get professional photography done. 
right? So go get a, 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 an underemployed wedding photographer and have that person come in on a Wednesday and shoot, shoot the firm. I would, I would continue to try and get pictures of yourself, your office, and I would also, along those lines, as, as we talk about local, get those photographs that are in front of iconic components of, so it's not the landmark picture to, to start ranking for personal injury lawyer near the Space Needle, but you're using the picture of you at the Space Needle to say like, I'm a Seattle lawyer, right? And I think those are the ways I would be using content and, and imagery to win the GMB game instead of, instead of thinking that there's some little SEO trick. Me with trick. a picture of standing in front of the state liquor store is a good thing. Uh, it depends. It depends on your market. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a. a, a I, I'll give you a. So, a, so maybe yes. <laughs> Last one. All right, we're getting the we're getting the axe here. I, I'll, I'll say one more thing about Google. So, Google Business Profile is really, really valuable real estate on search. Here's a couple things to think about. One, most people that are gonna see your Google Business Profile are searching on your name, right? They're brand searches. And so highlighting good works in your community, testimonials, video testimonials, client testimonials, people singing your praises. I think all the stuff, the behind the scenes stuff is good there too. Um, another one that we've seen really work really, really well is, is that if, you, if you're gonna do offers or you're gonna do contests or stuff, put them in your Google Business Profile photos because if you go on social media and you say, hey, we're giving away an uh, Amazon gift card for some, whatever it is. For a review, don't do that. You can't do that, but um, you know, you're gonna give away an Amazon gift card for some kind of contest or something. Like, or uh, you wanna support local businesses, so we're like, hey, we want, we're, we're partnering with this local restaurant, um, get a free uh, meal on us. You have to go to our Google business profile, though, to, get the, uh, to sign up for the offer. And what that does is, is that it causes people to search for you on Google and then click into your Google business profile. And I'm not gonna go into all of the uh, tinfoil hat stuff about user engagement with Google business profiles, but the more that you can get people to engage with the photos, to watch the videos, to click through stuff, posts and stuff in your Google business profile, the more likely Google's going to reward that. And so I'd find creative ways to get people to your Google business profile, both with pictures, with video. Um, you can also, with posts uh, as of now, and they're always changing this stuff, but you can link back to other pages of your website. And so motivating people to search and click through to your Google business profile with imagery is a really, really effective way to use pictures in Google business profiles. All right, well, we have one more question to answer, but before we do that, Thank you guys for Thank all coming you. out. Thank this kind you of so blew, much. blew us away. Yeah, we're um, if you liked this, please tell the Filevine people that they should have <laughs> us come back next year. And I mean this, Guy and I will serve cheeseburgers. At least I will serve yeah, cheeseburgers. Yeah, Conrad will bring cheeseburgers. You're not excited about I'll this. I'll pass them out. I, <laughs> <laughs> we will serve cheeseburgers at lunch uh, at not the next conference. Eats cheeseburgers. But I'm never. serious about this, and this is how you should be thinking about your own. The reason I'm saying this is A, we want to come back, and B, think about your own marketing. Don't tell us you like us, tell everyone else that you like us, especially the Filevine people, okay? Uh, right? And if you don't like this, if you thought this was garbage, yes. now tell us. No, we'll go to Apple, it. go to Apple Podcasts and leave a nasty negative review. We'd love to read them. <laughs> uh, for Hennessy Digital. Um, <laughs> no, uh, so, all right, uh, before we say goodbye, our last question, and you can have the last hat. All right, hopefully I make this a good one. Um, all right, what's a finishing last piece here of advice you'd give to firm owners who do a lot of random acts of marketing and don't understand why their marketing's not working? Watch this, I'm gonna tie, see I just, I just asked you to tell Filevine how much they like us, or you like us. The random acts of marketing can go away if you're using a intake management software like LeadDocket. Right, so you should be tracking this, you should be drawing graphs, you should understand where your marketing's coming from, you should be analyzing how things are performing, you should be doing this, maybe you're working in the EOS format, but you should be looking at this at a quarterly level. Going into 2025, like it's September right now, you guys should have a plan at this point in time to be thinking about when are we getting together as a firm <clears throat> and deciding where we want to go in 2025 and what are, again, in EOS parlance, what are the rocks that we need to achieve in order to get there during 2025? And then you check in quarterly. If you're not looking at this quarterly, at the least, like you are just gonna be doing random acts of marketing. And the other problem with random acts of marketing while we're at a conference 
Lots of you go to conferences, you hear people like me and Guy talk about this thing that they're doing for that client, and then you go home and you're like, we should do this, everybody, right? That is a random act of marketing. I would be wary of, of picking up the shiny objects. Yeah, I'll just piggyback on that. I mean, <clears throat> and I, Conrad mentioned EOS. Uh, we run on an entrepreneur operating system, the book Traction, for folks that are taking notes that are not familiar with that. But th the reason that that stuff works is because you now have a framework to actually stick to a plan also with feedback loops within that plan to say, hey, this is working and you've got you know, 90 day worlds to, to check in to say maybe we need to make a pivot. But the fix to random acts of marketing is a plan. Like you have to have a plan that's gonna be you know, a, a, probably an annual plan. And even within that plan, you're like, you know, look, you're seeing early on, you're like, some of this stuff's not working, we can tweak it. But the problem is that we get is, is like, okay, and I, I always bring this up because I, it always hit me. Pokemon Go comes out. We get phone calls from people that are like, drop everything you're doing, we need to do Pokemon Go marketing. And I'm like, are you serious? Now look, there are some lawyers that actually leverage Pokemon Go, great, good for you. But to just abandon everything you're doing every time something new comes out, it, you're gonna be doing stuff that was working that you didn't even know it was working because you're not giving it time to work and you're not, you don't have the actual tracking or management protocols and systems in place to actually know that it's working. So it's not a tactical thing, it's more about a mindset about like, we got a plan, we got some ways that we're gonna measure whether the plan's working, but stick to the plan, refine the plan, but don't just drop the plan in the middle of the, of the plan. For all of you who thought Clubhouse was going to change your marketing world, <laughs> you are the problem. <clears throat> That's it, thank you all again so much. Uh, enjoy the show. Yeah, money make a world go round. Yeah, money make a world go round. Yeah, money make a world go round.